And so somebody say supernatural faith. Supernatural faith. Oh, thank God for two of you. Somebody say supernatural <laughs> faith. Supernatural <laughs> faith. Oh, somebody say again, supernatural faith. Supernatural faith. Do you know that he is a supernatural God? Yes. yes. He's a supernatural God who is able to do supernatural things. I wonder why sometimes that supernatural things don't happen. Have you ever thought that? Why does supernatural things not happen all the time? Well, today I hope that through the message this afternoon that I'm able just to help us to impart some wisdom, impart some scripture, impart some of the heart of God into us this afternoon. I say us because I want to see more. You know, I've been in church 20 years and I saw people be healed on the spot. I've saw things happen. I've saw people be delivered and healed. I've saw people grow. I've saw things grow back. I've saw miracles. But I want to see more. Amen. I want to see more. I want to see more things take place. The title for today's message is What is God Doing? Mm-hmm. What is God Doing? Now, if you see that statement on a piece of paper, there's two ways you can read that. What is God doing? <laughs> or, What is God doing? <laughs> Depends your perspective. On God. You see, many of us all have went through trials, situations, heartaches, pain in our life, and maybe you've came to this world or you've been driven to this place. You say, God, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Where are you? Why? Maybe you've been going through a rough time, a breakup, or a death in the family, or a situation, and you've just been crying, God, what? Anybody ever been there? This week? Oh, yes. (laughs) (laughs) I've been there myself. I've been there myself many times. And I'll be there again. Let's be real. I'll be there again. But today I want to share with you a few encouraging verses that I really believe are going to help us. You know, we've been preaching through the book of Galatians. And this week, if you've been following, you'll know that we're on Galatians 6. We're in Galatians chapter 6, and uh, you've been reading with us, following with us online or in person. You'll know that we've been reading the book of Galatians for the last you know, five, six, I think seven weeks now, actually. I think I went two weeks on, on chapter 3. But we've been talking about how the Apostle Paul, he writes this letter to the church in the region of Galatia. There was a region of churches. And he's writing to them and he's telling them and, and asking them the question. He said, hey, listen, we just planted this church and, 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 and we planted it right with faith, with expectation. And he's talking to the church and some of the church, obviously not all of the church, but he's talking to the church. And he said, hey, listen, this, this corrupt culture that you live in, this environment, this society that you live in, this godless, Christless, antichrist society that you live in, has it started to eat in? Has it started to... Uh, detract your faith? Has it started to pull you away from the teachings that I gave you in the beginning? I see, I believe that this is an on-time book. All of the scripture is on time, but I believe that for this church, it's an on-time book, it's an on-time study that we do. Because we're living in a time that is unparalleled. We're living in a time, we're living in an age, we're living in a season where we're coming close to the end of times. Nobody knows the day, nobody knows the hour. But if we follow the, the, the signs of the age and the signs of the times, we can tell that things have taken place. And we live in a, a, an age where there's so much uncertainty. There's so much uncertainty. There's so much, there's virus, there's illness, there's, you just watch the news, there's hurricanes, there's tornadoes. I mean, there, there's, 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 there's flooding in certain parts of the world that usually get sunshine all year round. Things have taken place. And Apostle Paul was telling the region of Galatia, you have to be careful how you live. Be careful the company you keep. Mm-hmm. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about good company corrupts bad character. Mm-hmm. And so if you consistently surround yourself with negative people and consistently, consistently surround yourself with the wrong crowd or people that who, do, who lack faith or have no faith, you'll find yourself being dragged in 
and you'll find your faith weakened. Because faith is like a muscle and when you surround yourself with faith, you'll, you'll, you'll feel yourself getting stronger and stronger. It's like if you go into the gym. How many of us ever go to the gym? We go to the gym and you go into the gym and you see everybody pumping iron. They're in there with a skinny, you know, leotards on and they're, you know, they're in there with things that are like four sizes too small for them. <laughs> and, they're in there, and they're in there and they're doing, they're doing the lunges and they're... <laughs> Stretch. You're standing in front of the mirror. <laughs> Somebody take a picture. I want this on Instagram. Okay. <laughs> so they go into the gym. One of the reasons they go into the gym is because it builds their faith. Because they go into the gym and the other people in there encourage them to go harder, mm -hmm. to go faster, mm -hmm. to lift more. I'm looking over at him. If he's lifting 10, I'm lifting 12. If she's running, if she's running at 15 k speed, I'm running at 20. Right? That's what happens. You go in there and they prayed. Hello, let's call her. It it's prayed. <laughs> but if you surround yourself with people that never go to the gym, then what's going to happen? The opposite's going to happen. Mm. You're going to start getting weak, you're going to start feeling feeble, you're going to start looking at yourself in the mirror and thinking you're just fading away. It's the same in the spiritual realm. It's the same in the spiritual sense. That if you surround yourself with unspiritual people as a spiritual being, you'll find yourself being dragged down. It happens a lot to people and it's the enemy's purpose to detract us. It's the enemy's purpose to isolate us, but it's God's purpose to insulate us. There's a difference between isolation and isolation. When you're insulated, you're surrounded, protected against the elements, against the problems. When you're isolated, that's where the enemy wants to get you. He wants to get you backed up so much into a corner that you begin to submit and surrender to him. And so it's important the company that you keep Somebody once says, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. <clears throat> and so as believers in the faith, it's important that we surround ourselves with people of the faith. I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that every friend you have has to be saved, has to be a Christian. I'm not saying that. If all the friends that you have are saved, I'm a bit concerned for you. <laughs> because as a saved believer, we should have unsaved friends. <laughs> That's how we share the gospel with them. I'm not saying you hang around with them and go to the nightclubs and slam shots with them. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is the Apostle Paul says in another letter in the Bible, he says, I become all things to all men. In other words, I go where they are, but I don't do what they do. And I lift them up from that area. And so, there's, there's, so we, we, we need to be surrounding ourselves with people that are going to encourage us and lift us up in the faith. Somebody say amen. amen. If I can have the first scripture out this afternoon, Galatians chapter 6 verse 9. Now this is a very famous portion of scripture. You've probably heard this. You've probably posted it. You've probably saw it on, on Instagram and you've maybe even preached from it before. Galatians 6 verse 9 from the New Living Translation. You should be on the screen behind me. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. Somebody say good. good. Let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. You see, this is such an important and encouraging verse. How many of us have heard this verse before? Let me see your hands if you've heard this verse before. Right, you've heard that verse before. It's an encouraging verse. You know, it's one of those verses that you hear if maybe you're going through a hard season. Maybe, you know, you're not seeing your promise fulfilled. You're not seeing the answer to your prayer. And, and somebody will say, oh, you know, don't be tired of doing good, brother. It's okay. You know, God's going to see you through. God's going to come through. And that is true. But let me just also share the context of where the scripture finds itself. You see, context is important. Have you ever walked in halfway through a conversation and you've heard a word or you've heard a few words <laughs> and you've took them completely out of context because you never heard it before or you never heard it after? You just hear a few words and you go, what? What about just walked in <laughs> you know, well, hold on a minute. You don't have who we're talking about. So context is important. And scripture 
it's no different. Scripture has to be taken in context. Mm. And so I'm going to share a little bit of context before we jump back into the scripture. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So the whole of chapter 6 of the book of Galatians is explaining generosity. Mm. It's explaining honor. And it's talking about supernatural faith. <laughs> it's explaining generosity, honor, and supernatural faith. If you go back to Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 in your Bibles, you'll see here that Paul says, Dear brothers and sisters, if any believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Hmm. Amen. So that tells us this morning there's a right path. Which also by that means tells us there's a wrong path. And so what he's saying here is, he's saying, listen, if you know someone that's lost and bound and in sin, help them. Reach out to them. Love them enough that you take some time to speak to them, to pray for them, to encourage them. Do something generous that's outside of your own time, of your own effort, something you don't have to hand a receipt in for and get the money back for. Something that comes out from your pocket, take somebody for a meal, take somebody for a walk, pick somebody up, come to church. You see, that's generosity. Second milestone. You see, we know lots of broken people. We know lots of people that are messed up. Maybe not messed up in the sense of in prison or in jail or, or you know, in drugs or crime, but we know people that are hurt. We know people that are broken. We know people that don't know Jesus. We know people that are still walking around, maybe don't have food in their kitchen or, you know, and so what it's saying here is it's, saying it's explaining generosity. In a sense of number one, we should be generous with people. Generous with our help. Generous in how we give. Generous in how we love people. Loving them and trying to get them back on to that path again. We should be generous with our time and generous with our honour. How do we honour God? We honour God by honouring God's people. By loving God's people. By honouring God's people, by loving God's creation. And that creation, that person, that person that's hurting, that person that's broken, may not look like you, may not sound like you, may not even be of the same faith, may be, in fact, of another faith. But we should be gently and humbly try and help that person back on to the right track. It also tells us in verse number six, now this can be a little bit, um, uncomf un uncomfortable for ministers and preachers to talk about this verse if you look at it in your Bible. This is where verse 7 and verse number uh, 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 verse 7 and 8 and 9 come into context. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers sharing all good things with them. Then verse number 7 comes, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Mm -hmm. This is quite an uncomfortable verse for ministers to share. Because it says here that those who I teach are supposed to take care of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sharing what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking you to go out and buy me a Ferrari. <laughs> Trust me, it's too small looking for the kids in here. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm sharing scripture. Mm. I'm sharing the Bible. And so this scripture that we talked about then, in the sense of do not get tired of doing good, comes after this verse, about taking care of those who take care of you. Mm. And then don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you reap. This is what this means. Let me explain to you and explain the context of what the scripture means. Many of us, we use this out of context, this scripture. This, we've quoted Galatians 6, 9. But Galatians 6, 9, it does talk about the, 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 the principle of reaping and sowing and reaping. But here in this verse, it's talking about you don't be misled. In other words, what it's saying is, don't say you do something if you don't do it. Mm. You can't mock God by claiming that you love people and love God and take care of God's church if you don't do it. Don't say it. Don't do it. Don't pretend. Don't mislead God. You can't mislead the Lord. And so that's what this comes from. You will always harvest what you plant. 
And so when it talks about don't be misled and you harvest what you plant, what it's really saying is don't claim to do something if you don't do it. Don't claim to be someone if you're not it. If you're not it, you're not it. If you're not there, you're not there. If that's not your faith level yet, that's not your faith level yet. Be cool with that. Be comfortable with that. Don't say things under pressure. Or don't say things or pretend to be something if you're not in. Because in that, what you're doing is, is you're mocking God. And so I'm not saying I, I want you guys to you know, bow down. I've been into some churches before where people bow down before the pastor and all that crazy stuff. Absolutely not saying that. I'm just sharing where the scripture comes from. That it's talking about generosity. It's talking about saying, don't pretend to be generous if you're not. Don't pretend, don't you know, don't pretend to, to be a blesser or to be generous or to do something if you're not. It's okay. It's better not to say something. Scripture that says it's better not to say something and, and not be it than not say something and not do it. Mm-hmm. And so it's talking about, uh, it's encouraging us then, these scriptures then, to be generous with our talent, our time, and our treasure. It's encouraging us to be generous with our resources, not just finances, but your time and your talent and your gifting and whatever it is that God's giving you the ability to do, to be faithful and to be generous Mm -hmm. to God and to God's people with that resource. Mm -hmm. You see, you cannot mock God deals with the idea that people talk about being talk about being spiritual, but they don't actually live it. You see, you can fill me. I trust you. Easily filled. <laughs> but we can't fill the Lord. Because he sees the heart. He sees our condition. He sees, he sees the reality of our lives. Mm-hmm. And so best not to try fill him. Best just to be honest. And say no. You see, there's a saying in the world that says this, the proof is in the pudding. Mm-hmm. You ever heard that saying? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The proof is in the pudding. In other words, if you break it down a little bit further, what I'm saying is, uh, it looks good on the outside. <laughs> it looks the part. But when you dig a little bit deeper, mm-hmm. you find it was really inside. Mm-hmm. In other words, appearance and promise aside, is there actual fruit and evidence of what it appears to be? Because if you are what you claim to be, you're doing what you claim to do, and you're whatever it is, there should be the evidence of fruit. And so the proof is in the pudding, which means that, you know, many of us in our times with the Lord, and trust me, I've grown up in the Lord, and I've said things, and I've done things, and I've, and I've, and I've pretended to be things, and I've wanted to be things, and I've, you know... But when there's a little bit of a deeper dig, but then when you grab the the, 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 the generosity and the honour of what it is that God is saying through the scriptures here, he's saying to them, he's saying, listen, don't be misled. Don't follow the crowd. Mm. Don't pretend to be something you're not. Be for be, be. My pastor always told me, man, he goes, listen, Mark, just be for real. Mm. Be yourself and be for real. Because mm. you know why? When you're yourself and you're real, you're at your most authentic, your most powerful, Amen. your most anointed. Mm. You're not pretending to be someone, you're not AKA, you're not alter ego, you're not, you're yourself. Mm. I was telling somebody last week, I made up a coffee with a fine young man, and I was telling him that at one stage of my life, you know, I used to dye my hair and wear, you know, wear t-shirts that were painted on, look like it was spray paint. <laughs> <laughs> I used to dye my hair and, you know, just working at the gym and, you know, it was all about the appearance. Mm. But I was living a false life. I was pretending to be something I wasn't, trying to be something I wasn't. The blessing of God is just being who you are. Don't be misled. Don't think you need to keep up with the Joneses. Don't think you need that, you know, be yourself and be for real. And allow God to bless you where you are. Amen. Mm-hmm. So many people in this world today that are living above their means and above their things. They're living in houses they can't afford. They're living in cars. They're driving in cars they can't afford. 
Mm. They're jetting off on holidays they can't afford. Mm. They're walking about in clothes that they can't afford. Mm. Why? Because Instagram supposedly says that this is how we should live. Mm. Our friends are doing it. Our neighbours are doing it. Mm. The most authentic and beautiful place you can be and I can be is happy in our own skin. Mm. Yeah. We may have a few wrinkles for those of us that have them. Not all of them have them. We may have a few scars, marks, tattoos. You know, we may look at ourselves in the mirror and think, man, where, who is this imposter? <laughs> <clears throat> but be yourself and be for real is a beautiful place. Mm. And so what God was saying here, what Paul was saying through the scriptures is, is that don't just look good on the outside. Mm -hmm. Don't just look the part. Don't be a fake. Be for real. Yeah. You know, God created you authentic. <clears throat> Out of all the seven or eight billion people on this earth, nobody has the same eyes as you. Nobody has the same fingerprint as you. Nobody has the same heartbeat as you. Nobody has the same voice as you. Doesn't matter if people say they sound like you. No, no, no. Your voice is unique. Your eyes are unique. Your hands are unique. The beat of your heart is unique. You are unique. So be yourself and be for real. Let me just stick a caveat in there. That, that, that doesn't mean you say, well, well, I'm just me, take me like I am. I'm just me, I'll never change. Well, this is just me, like it or lump it. <laughs> to an unsaved brother or sister, I could never say, okay, I hear you. But when Christ is living in you, mm. it's never just like you or not. Mm. It's growing from glory to glory to glory. Mm -hmm. But you can't go to the next level if you're not truthful about where you really are. Mm. It's like a GPS. Mm. GPS can't take you to your destination if you don't tell it where you are. Mm. You can't fake a GPS. You have to first be truthful. This is where I am. This is where I am. This is my starting point. Then from the starting point, the GPS will give you your destination and your route to take. But first of all, you have, first of all, you have to be honest about where you really are. Mm. And one of the amazing things about the Lord is He knows your heart better than you know yours. Mm. That's why scripturally He says the heart is deceitful above all things. <laughs> That's why we need the Holy Spirit to guide us continually. The good, side about the, the good thing about the Lord is the Lord isn't fooled by the outward appearance. When he was looking for a prophet, when Samuel the prophet was looking for someone to anoint, David's dad rolled out all the brothers. Here's the strong ones. Here's the big ones. Here's the healthy ones. Here's the... No, 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 I'm not looking for that. No, I'm looking for someone with a heart after God. He says, because that's someone that I can anoint. That's someone I can use. That's someone that I can pour my spirit into. That's someone that I can trust with my weight. Mm. That's someone that's not going to run away and take all the glory for himself. The good thing about God is God sees the inward parts. And when you realize that and you live like that, it's easier to say, okay, well, I, I am a bit of a mess. <laughs> Inside, I am a Work, work, in, work in construction ill with somebody. There's nothing wrong with saying that. But when we try to be someone we're not, pretend to we're not, kid them or someone we're not, have an AKA, alter ego, alter persona, when we try and be someone we're not, we're not honouring God like that. Mm. Because we're pretending we're someone else that He created. Mm. He created you unique. You know, your nose might be a bit long, your ears, <laughs> your ears might be a little bit straggly, and your teeth might be like a broken dentist. <laughs> but God still loves you and you've got a beautiful plan for your life but here's the thing you reap what you sow thank you for the apple. apple here's the apple here it is you reap what you sow right you plant apple seeds you get apples huge revelation for you right <laughs> You're like, wow, really? So 
someone once says these words, you can teach what you know, but you'll reproduce who you are. You see, you can pretend, if you're, a, if, you're a, if you're an apple, you can pretend to be a banana. <laughs> yeah. If you're an apple, you can pretend to be a plum. <laughs> but ultimately, what you're going to be produce is what you want. And so there's no point in being fake about the outside. There's no point in trying to be somebody else. Because that somebody else isn't going to reproduce what it is that you're looking for. You want to be honest with what's inside. Because the outside looks all shiny. But it's what's inside that counts. And so when we're truthful about who we really are, where we're really at, what God's really doing in our life, we honor God. I say, yeah, I, I still got work to do. I still got stuff I need to work out. I still got some areas in my life that aren't perfect. Mm-hmm. I still got some areas in my life that aren't holy and righteous and under the blood of Jesus. I still got struggles. Mm-hmm. I still curse sometimes. I, you know, under my breath. <laughs> I still get angry sometimes. Mm-hmm. I still, like, you know, walk around and stub my toe on the end of the bed and go, yeah, <laughs> swing. <laughs> I'm not perfect, I'm a pastor, I'm not perfect. Mm. Still some areas I'd love to grow in. I'd love to be a better husband. I'd love to be a better father. You know, I'd love to be a better disciple. Mm. I'd love to be a better preacher. I'd love to be better in the streets. But I'm never going to get better on these areas. If I pretend that I'm all that in a bag of chips and the only way I'm going to get better in certain areas if I admit my weaknesses mm-hmm. and they start to build them mm-hmm. and start to work on them. And so one of the ways we honor God is we honor God by just saying, this is where I am. Mm-hmm. This is who I am. I don't claim to have it all together. I don't claim to be this and that. Mm. It's one of the ways that we honor the Lord. And so we mock God when we claim to live one way, but we don't. We mock God when we talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk. We mock God when we claim promises that we've not even sown into. So, you know, that's one of the main ways that we mock God. is by saying that we're standing on God's promises, but our life shows otherwise. And we mock God also when we talk of harvest without planting seed. We mock God by saying, yeah, I'm believing in prayer for things when you never pray. And listen, when I was studying for this and praying over this and reading over this, I was like, oh Lord, I was fucking Jesus. (laughs) Forgive me, Lord. Mm -hmm. I don't want to mock the Lord. Mm -hmm. I want to honor him. And so it says, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. Which means that even as we go through the trials and struggles, we still go to do good. Even when we're going through the hard times, even when, even when we're going through the tough times, we still go to turn up. We still go to pray. We still go to read. We still go to get into the Word. We still go to give. We still go to study. We still go to fast. We still go to love people. Even though you're going through your struggles and your trials, it's not an opportunity and it's not a time to run away from the Bible or to run away from God. It's a time to run closer to Him. Mm-hmm. And so many people, we claim the scripture of oh God in due season. But you can only claim that promise of due season if you're continuing to do good even in the out season. Even in the off season. Even in the unwell season. Even in the tired season. If you're continuing to do good, in other words, what you're saying here, if you continue to sow, again, not financially, I'm talking about generosity, sowing honor, sowing respect, sowing love, sowing graciousness, sowing forgiveness, sowing compassion. These are the types of things that you can say, Lord, I've been struggling, I've been going through a season, I've been going through a hard time, I've been sick, 
I've been going through warfare in my mind. But you know what? I'm still turning up. I'm still doing good. I'm still serving. I'm still praying. I'm still believing. Yeah, the weather looks overcast. Yeah, the land looks like it's hard. Yeah, I don't see any harvest yet. I don't see any fruit yet. I don't see the promise yet. But I'm still believing. And I'm still praying. And I'm still hoping. And I'm still trusting. And I'm still believing. And I'm still hoping. And I'm still... You know what that is? Supernatural faith. Sometimes we make supernatural faith to be something that it's not. You know what supernatural faith is? You're natural in his super. You want supernatural results? You ain't first do the natural. He does the super. So what's the natural? Keep sowing. Keep believing. Keep trusting. Keep praying. Keep turning up. Keep showing up. Keep giving. Keep releasing. Keep forgiving. Keep trusting. Keep loving. Keep having compassion. Keep reaching out. Keep trusting. Keep... When you keep doing all that, what you're doing is, trust me, watch this, when you're doing that, what you're saying is, you're saying, God, I'm giving you authority to add your super to my natural. But if you're not doing the natural, he got nothing to add his super to. And the problem is with some of us, is we've given up. Oh God, help me. <laughs> we've given up. Because we've not saw the answer. We stopped praying. Or because we've not seen the open door. We stop trusting. Or because we haven't saw that increase yet, we stop giving. And that's what happens. Because seed time and harvest are not both at the same time. You don't plant a seed one day and get a harvest the next. It's a time, and that time is called process. Mm -hmm. Somebody say, ouch. Ouch. <laughs> you see, nobody loves the process. Everybody wants the promise. Everybody wants the prize. Everybody wants to be a diamond, but nobody wants to be cut. In the original text, when it says, let's not get tired, another translation it says, don't lose heart. It has this imagery of a woman pregnant with child. That a woman pregnant with child carrying this promise. Mm. But it's not yet came to fulfillment. And you know, I've never been pregnant, but I've been around. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but I've been around Zoe when she has been. And listen, there's times when you're carrying that child. Mm. You're just like, man, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> Come out already. You know? Go in, mother's in the house, give me a wave, come on. <laughs> and one of the things I know that you stood by Zoe so much. When's it due? <laughs> How long have you left now? <laughs> you only asked me that yesterday. <laughs> she was walking to church and that's all she'd get. <laughs> How long have you got left now? <laughs> well, by uh, detracting a week since the last time you asked me. <laughs> but carrying the baby can be tiresome, it can be wearisome. There's times when you don't feel like getting up, there's times when you don't feel like carrying it, there's times you just won't get it out of me now. But in due season, mm -hmm. at the right time, if you don't give up, you'll reap the harvest, you'll see the blessing, you'll see the fruit of your seed. You see, a pregnant woman, the seed's been planted, but you don't see the promise for nine months. You see, we live in an age where we plant something one day and we want it the next. 
and we don't see it, so we give up. That's why so many people give up at the gym. Mm -hmm. They want to go to the gym on Tuesday and look like Rambo on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> right? Don't happen. <laughs> that don't happen. <laughs> You want to eat right, you want to eat protein, you want carbs, mm. no steps, no. <laughs> you want to live right. But in due season, if you don't give up, and you keep doing good, and you keep serving, and you keep loving, and you keep sowing seeds, mm. that's what it's talking about. Sowing seeds, good seeds, godly seeds, righteous seeds, God's seed, God's word. In due season, mm. You'll reap, you'll deliver, and you'll receive your harvest. Here's the encouraging part. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, if God can put it up. I planted Apollos what? But God gave the increase. I planted Apollos what? But God gave the increase. Who gives the increase? Who makes things grow? God. So our, is that, is that up there, Gary? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're looking at me, you're looking at me all strange, are you? <laughs> That's the encouraging part. The encouraging part is this. You plant, you water, pray, but God makes it grow. And in due season, that thing's going to pop out like a baby pops out. <laughs> Before you know it, you plant that seed in your pot and you're watering that thing, and then you come down the next morning or one morning, and for months you've not saw anything. And you come down one sunny morning and that pot is in the sunlight, <laughs> and you walk up to it and you look at it and you go, Breakthrough. That doesn't mean nothing's been happening. That means stuff's just been happening that you can't see. <sighs> see, God works in the unseen world. Mm -hmm. He doesn't always show his hand. He doesn't always telegraph his next move. In fact, in Isaiah, the Bible says, his ways are not our ways. Mm -hmm. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. As believers, people of faith, their trust and our confidence needs to be in the process of God. And that process of God is, hey, if you've planted and you're watered and praying, the blessing is and the encouragement is that in due season, it's coming. When we do our part, God does his part. Somebody say our part. Oh. Here's one of my favorite scriptures that I was given many, many years ago. Proverbs 21, verse 30. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. Mm -hmm. I was given this scripture many, many moons ago when I was uh, going through a trial. Many moons ago. I'm talking about over 10 years ago. I can't remember exactly when and where, but I was given it and it, and it, and it, it stuck in my mind. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. You see, this is the amazing thing about the tension between divine sovereignty and human authority. Is that God is on our side, fighting for us. But like the horse in the battle, the horse has to be prepared for the battle. But the victory comes from the Lord. In other words, what he's saying is, that you have to prepare yourself and do your part. Because if there's no seed, there's no harvest. If there's no prayer, there's no answer. If there's no faith, there's no miracle. If there's no natural, there's no supernatural. But victory comes from the law. You see, here's the great thing about God that maybe Stephen and Sharon can come back. Here's a great thing about the Lord, is this. God and his sovereignty 
could make you pass every trial and every test and every exam with that. God could open doors. God could do things. God could do it now. God could remove every obstacle, take away every trial, close every door. Like that. Because he's able. But again, there's something that takes place in the process. There's something that takes place in the build up, in the learning, in the leaning, in the waiting. There's something that grows in that season. It's called character, perseverance, faith, trust. When you can't see that answer, when you can't see that breakthrough, when you can't see that, I may not see the answer yet, but I'm prepared. I may not see them come with Lord right now, but I'm still praying. I may not see that answer in front of me. I may not see that increase. I may not see that job. I may not see that yet. But I tell you one thing. I'm prepared for it. Because the horse is prepared for what's coming. But it's the Lord that brings the victory. There's a story, and I want to finish with this. There's a story of the butterfly. Butterfly wasn't always flying around, as beautiful as they are. The butterfly at one point was in a thing called a cocoon. I think I saved that like it was French. Cocoon. <laughs> that butterfly from its birth was always born to fly. But never has always had the ability to. Because for a season of its life, it was in preparation. And do you know that that preparation period was there from the Lord? Because if a butterfly could have flew from the beginning, it would have flew from the beginning. But God created it thus way. And do you know that if you enable the butterfly to fly early from his cocoon. But it won't fly properly. Because it's in the breaking free. It's in the breaking out. It's in the struggle. Does its wings get strong? If you take someone out of the process too soon, they may lift apart. But they ain't got the character. And that's why I love the Lord. Because He allows us to go through the process. And trust me, the process isn't always easy. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. But when we understand that God is with us, when we understand that if we prepare ourselves, and if we understand that if we sow and invest and give and be generous and honor and give God some natural to put his super on, that's how you activate heaven in your life. And so listen this afternoon, I just want to say this. I don't know where you've been struggling or what you've been struggling or maybe lack of faith or lack of trust and maybe you just want to get out of this situation you're in right now. God, what are you doing? Where are you? Why? You know what he's doing? The Bible says we are predestined to be conformed into the image of Jesus. You know, in the struggle, in the wait, in the trial, in the tribulation, in the exam, do you know what he's trying to do? Make you more like Jesus. Amen. 
You know, Jesus had to be in the grave three days. Why did he not rise earlier? Because it was prophesied before him. But the temple would be destroyed three days later. What is it? That even there was a process that he had to follow in order for him to reach his fulfillment. Let's stand to our feet this afternoon. Michael. You know, I know life, I know life can be tough, man. And I know we can have our challenges. But this word is to encourage us today. But no matter what you face, and no matter what you go through, no matter what's in front of you, no matter what's surrounding you, no matter what you're in the middle of, you trust God in the process. Keep on doing good. Keep on serving. Keep on loving. Keep on forgiving. Keep on having compassion. Keep on giving chances. Keep on keeping on. Keep on honoring God. Keep on being yourself. Love you and who you are. Love you. Look in the mirror and say, I love you.
question isn't what's God doing. The question is what are we doing? Because when we work out what we're doing, then we can tell what He's doing.